As you promised me that I was more than all the miles combined, you must have had yourself a change of heart. Welcome to the New York Times podcast, your couple capos and hundred dons of music news and criticism. I'm your host, John Caramonica. What are you pulling up with? You're pulling up with a stick season. That's right. It's Noah Kahan week on Popcast. I know y'all have been itching. Y'all been itching for it. And maybe the reason it's taking so long is for a while, I have to confess, I was not itching for it. But I have finally arrived. I'm already getting dragged by our guests this week. We're going to talk all things Noah Kahan, who is having... I would call it a moment, but it's much more prolonged than that. And it is arced, I think, very differently than what we think of historically as a moment. And we're going to get into that. And we're going to talk about it on two levels. We're going to talk about the music and the relationship of Khan's music with some of the other artists who have been finding a lot of success over the last year, especially the Zach Bryans of the world, et cetera. And we're also going to talk about the power of TikTok. God bless. It's something I think about truly the last thing I think about before bed every night. And the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning, a travesty. Jason Lipschitz is here. Jason, welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited you're here. Jason's the executive director for music at Billboard. Heavy, from what I heard, the whispers in the Billboard offices, very heavy in the <laughs> Noah Khan game. So I'm a convert. What can I say? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I'm, I'm hearing, <laughs> I'm hearing the information is trickling to me is all I'm saying. <laughs> also with us, Rebecca Jennings is here, senior correspondent in Fox. First time on podcast. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you so much for having me. Wrote an article slash your newsletter recently about the stomp clap. Hey, hey, clap, stomp. Stomp, clap, you know. hey. Stomp and holler. Stomp, clap, hey. Hey, ho, pop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Call it whatever. A lot of, like, I really should have the Claritin D out because we're talking about a lot of stuff I'm allergic to this week on <laughs> podcast. So at the beginning of the episode, we're listening to Stick Season. If you have been living under a rock, Stick Season is Noah Kahan's breakout song. It is not his only big song, but it is the song that seems to be carrying him out of the niche that he has cultivated over the last three or four years into broader awareness. And Jason, maybe let's start with you a minute ago, I was saying that there's a moment, but it's not really a moment because Noah Kahan has been, frankly, famous and successful for quite some time before what's happened in the last, let's say, four months or five months. Can you talk a little bit about the first three years of Noah Kahan before we arrive at this moment? What was going on with him that set him up to take advantage of what's happening now? Noah is he's 26 years old. He's from Vermont. And as you alluded to, he's been releasing music for a bit and releasing music on a major label. He's had... He got signed pre-pandemic. Yeah. I mean, he put out his debut album called Busy Head in 2019, uh, like you said, pre-pandemic. It's interesting because he's on Republic Records and Republic Records has a, a lot of big names, obviously Taylor Swift and The Weeknd and Drake, etc. But Republic just has a huge roster of artists. And he was just one I'm of also the signed ones... to Republic Records, which is crazy. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Republic yeah. OVO joint deal for, Jay, story. for John. He's just one of the ones that was flying under the radar for years. And just every few months, you'd be like, hey, he's got a new single. Hey, he's got a new album. Hey, he's back on tour. And, and that was his main thing was just like grinding out tour dates with not a, like a ton of mainstream attention. And that, again, lasted a good four years. He also, aside from he put out an album from in 2019 and 2021, and in the middle, he put out a pandemic EP like a lot of artists did called Cape Elizabeth. His first album four years ago had a pretty solid pedigree, like Joel Little, who worked with Lord and Taylor Swift produced part of it. Julia Michaels was on it. So it, it he's been active in that space for sure. When we think about how labels of that size function, I don't often think of them as cultivating slow burn artists who start with a modest fan base and inch their way towards something. More often than not, I think what you find are, are labels essentially cutting losses with people and saying, hey, we, we signed you. We thought you'd have a shot. We thought you'd have a TikTok hit. We thought you'd have an immediate pop crossover or even like adult radio type hit. And it didn't go. And thank you so much. And now go sign to New West Records with all your friends. Like, <laughs> wh why do you think that didn't happen for Noah Khan? I think 
a big part of it does have, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about genre and sound, but I do think in terms of like the folk pop, folk rock lane, so much of that has to do with touring and it it's way less reliant on a big hit single and a big kind of TikTok moment, which eventually was coming for Noah. But again, it's just grinding out tour dates over and over and over. A, a good kind of A to B comparison is you look at what's going on with Hozier, who another he's on Columbia Records, another major label success story. He blew up with Take Me to Church. He hasn't had like a mainstream moment since then, basically, in terms of a big hit single, but he's still playing to really big audiences. And I think that's baked into that troubadour modern folk sound. And I think to answer your question, I think that's why someone like Noah gets a little bit more rope of, hey, even if you don't have a big hit song or even an album, his first two albums didn't really chart at all, but he still was just collecting fans on the road and he was just able to do that. Rebecca, I feel like during the Zach Bryan rise, I was thinking a lot about what it meant to be an artist very associated with place. Like all the other stars that who we've just mentioned in passing, Sure, Drake is from Toronto, whatever, but we don't think of them as fully grounded in place. But what you're seeing now is I think the emergence, especially in this musical space of people who are very tied to a place and an ideology from that place. So can you talk us through what does it mean, the Vermontness of this? <laughs> I cannot explain to you how famous Noah Khan is in the state of Vermont. We don't, we're a very small state. We don't really get a lot of famous things besides like Ben and Jerry's and fish. Bernie Sanders? And Bernie Sanders. Is he Bernie Sanders famous? Um, yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. I think. He's yeah. Huge. That's, that says it all. That's. Yeah. <laughs> he's huge. And part of that is because of the kind of music he does or the music that he's most famous for now, which is this sort of, like I said in my piece, it's a little bit stomp, clap, hey. A lot of the lyrics are about the peculiarities of growing up in northern New England, where I think a lot of that kind of music relates more to growing up in the South or the West or the Rockies. Northern New England, like no one cares. No one lives there. <laughs> and it, But it is a very particular kind of feeling of growing up. And, you know, and, and second, because his biggest hit during the pandemic, the one that went really TikTok viral, was called Stick Season. And Stick Season is a time in Vermont where seasons are very important to us. We get all of them, sometimes in the span of one day. Um, and Stick Season is basically what happens after our beautiful foliage falls down and the snow hasn't come yet. So all you see when you look at the mountains are just brown sticks. And the song is very evocative of that time, both in its its use of place, but also it's it's waiting for your friends to come home for the holidays and being really sad. Can I ask, in addition to stick season, is there a project like if we're gonna listen to another Noah track that's very Vermonty? Yes. What would what would that be? Let's listen to something, <laughs> but tell me what that would be. Okay, so he has one song called Homesick. I mean, it's it's very on the nose. It's very like, don't you miss your childhood home? And it includes the line, I'm mean because I grew up in New England because we are known for our coldness, although I don't think that's a very fair um, <laughs> stereotype. But, but yeah, it, it's a lot of, I grew up in a small town. It was very cold, but we were warm on the inside. <laughs> wow. All right, let's listen to a little bit of Homesick. It, everybody go get like a, a cardigan or something. Not a Taylor <laughs> cardigan, although if you have, that's fine too. That's an interesting entry point, I think, for thinking about Noah Khan and even that contrast between what he's doing and what like Southern musicians of a, of a similar stripe are doing. One of the things that I sh am struck by now that I've taken the time to go back through Khan's catalog is there is a specificity to the songwriting, a detail level specificity that feels in the context of the genre a tiny bit wrong. 
I feel like sometimes he'll say something that feels very particular. And I'm like, this detail maybe is like an indie rock song detail, not a roots or like rural type music detail. And I wonder, maybe that's just my jaded ears at this point, but I wonder on some level if the, the, the slight dissonance between the urbaneness of the phrasings and the rootsness of the music, if, if that's actually what's drawing people to it, because it's not a combination that other folks are doing. Jason, I wonder, can you tell me where you think Noah's songwriting fits into the larger genre question that we've been just getting to, to talk about now, as far as what else is happening in the space? That's a really astute observation in the sense of when you think back to the kind of, and I'm sure we're going to get back into the Mumford of it all oh, yeah. and the kind of oh, yeah. early 2010s <laughs> stomp clap and, and shout out to Rebecca's piece, which was really great kind of touching upon this, but that was very universal. It had some sort of like nuggets of time and place, but it was very much huge. I will wait for you. I belong with you anthems. Yeah, they were like theatrical. They were theatrical and like somehow unspecific in that way. Like they used reference points, but they didn't they weren't trying to like lyrically. They weren't delimiting anybody. They weren't excluding anybody with lyrical specificity. And Noah doesn't do that. Like Noah is, has very kind of rousing songs, but Stick Season is a perfect kind of entry point in the sense of being very specific. I didn't know what Stick Season was, Rebecca. I had no no idea before I heard this song. I actually wanted to ask you, do people before this, did people walk around being like, hey, look, it's Stick Season. Winter's coming soon. Is that like a, is that like a thing that happens? So it's actually a really old timey Vermontism. And we have a lot of those. Oh. One, my family's been in Vermont since the revolution. So there's one road hard and put away wet. That one's a really good one. There's a couple other, like they're just like, really hokey, sometimes French Canadian influence, sometimes like Massachusetts influence, sometimes like we sound like Midwesterners. It's it's a very like weird combination of people's backgrounds. But yes, but but I think Noah Khan's stick season absolutely made that more of like a thing that is coming coming up in average conversation. And, and I actually, even just based on what you just said about that kind of intersection of multiple communities, yeah. is that tension of rural and urban, rustic and oat. Is that something that is at play in other aspects of Vermont culture? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I think we think when we think of Vermont culture, we think of when a lot of hippies from New York moved up in the fifties and sixties. And now we have this Vermont culture that's very associated with Subaru Outbacks with 75 bumper stickers on them. And Bernie Sanders, again, like someone who came from Brooklyn. Um, and we're, we're, we're known for our great social programs and everything. But ultimately, Vermont's heritage is that of farms and rednecks <laughs> and like, you know, and I, I'm from a big I'm from the biggest city in Vermont, which is 40,000 people. It's the city feeling and people with city ideas. But we go 10 minutes outside and you're in farmland where people vehemently disagree with those things. We also have so much homelessness, a lot of problems, so much heroin, whatever. It's an interesting state. And I think having Noah Khan be having a real moment right now is very bizarre for a lot of Vermonters. Jason, I wonder, do you think that Noah Khan has this big moment if Zach Bryan doesn't have his big moment last year? I feel like I anticipated this question. I'm sorry. Forgive, I feel like... For, forgive me. This is the Zach Bryan Weekly podcast. <laughs> this is... <laughs> You have the numbers. You've got the data. Come on. I mean, they're so huge at the same time now. And obviously they had this huge song now, Sarah's Place. I think the answer is yes, because I think that you tie them together. But in the same way that Zach Bryan shoots up with, with a very distinct sound in the country lane. I think Noah shoots up in the same exact kind of way in the folk lane and kind of folk pop lane. I think that obviously they've supported each other and I think that they exist in a kind of like symbiosis of people who don't love country music can love Zach Bryan and people who aren't like folk heads can love Noah. It does stand alone. What we were just talking about in terms of the lyrical specificity and the kind of storytelling that translates to posts on Instagram and, and TikTok. And we'll get into kind of how he 
grew on TikTok. But that stuff reminds me of Zach Bryan, but also of Olivia Rodrigo and Taylor Swift and like all of these artists who are are blowing up as pop stars, but as singer songwriters on social media. So I do think that this would have happened to Noah regardless, especially based on the songs that from Stick Season, the album, and then from the deluxe edition this year. This also came up a little bit on Podcast Deluxe this week because we were talking about how successful Mitski has been on TikTok. And obviously Mitski is not a, an artist who is waking up in the morning and being like, I wish to create a song that will soundtrack a million TikToks. I, I don't think that's what she's doing. But what what you have with her, and I think this is maybe similar to to, to Noah, is you have someone who speaks in a language that connects with the existential concerns of a large number of creatively oriented people. Those creatively oriented people happen to also create videos and by extension are pulling Mitski into that space. And I wonder if that's not too dissimilar from what's happening with Noah Kahan, which is like the generation and type of person that his music is connecting with are carrying him into a space that maybe is not the most natural space for music that sounds like what he does, but just by sheer numbers, it becomes a TikTok thing. Does that feel right? Like Rebecca, does that like based on your view on how he's moved through the TikTok ecosystem, does that resonate or is it something else? Absolutely. I think even more than being like from Vermont, he's a young person artist. His music is being soundtracked to all these TikToks of these people weeping, (laughs) weeping (laughs) over their homesickness or they don't really know how to grow up. It's very soft core. It's people that miss miss home or feel confused or it's people cry at the concerts all the time. It's big for that. And that's why it resonates so much with high school, college, 20 somethings, 30 somethings. You don't see older people really resonating with this music because it's about this sort of I went to therapy and I have anxiety and depression and I know the words to describe those feelings and I know how you're supposed to talk about them. And I've lived a life online where like that's destigmatized in this cool way, but also this kind of corny and cringe way. And so you get just all these TikToks of these people just like sobbing, you know, that's beautiful in a lot of ways, but it's funny in others. Jason, how do you see Noah Gahan's effectiveness on TikTok and in relation to other similar art generation artists in that space? It's two things. I think the first thing is that he's become very good at teasing songs on TikTok. He's just figured out how to play snippets, juice anticipation for new songs. We saw it with Stick Season, the song last year. And then this year, we really saw it with Dial Drunk, where he just teased the hell out of it for a long time. The song comes out and is basically already a hit before it it even comes out in full and then becomes his first top 40 hit. It gets a Post Malone remix. And so I think just the we've seen that from other artists memorably last year with the song like Unholy, but he's also really harnessed that kind of teasing power. Can we listen to Dial Drunk? Because I I do think I don't want to say that the Post Malone version is superfluous, but I I do think that like the the original version also totally does the job. Maybe let's listen to original Dial Drunk just to, to honor the 1.0. This is Dial Drunk Snow Cop. I'm untethering from the parts of me you recognize. From charming to alarming in seconds. Teasing a song like Dial Drunk obviously is a big part of his TikTok appeal, but also just in terms of what Rebecca was saying, in terms of the the earnestness of the music, he really translates that. He transmits that on TikTok himself. But then you also see other TikToks of, of people harnessing his lyrics and weeping. And it's funny because Noah is not like a super serious guy. If you watch interviews with him, if you see his shows, he's funny, he's quippy, he's self-deprecating but the the music is so earnest and and we see a lot of this right now in pop music i mentioned like taylor swift obviously but also phoebe bridgers like a gracie abrams like all of these artists who are extracting powerful lyrical statements and then kind of using them on tiktok to amplify their music and their profile so i think it's the teasing 
as well as just the general earnestness that he transmits on there. The t- the teasing is interesting. This is not a uh, an apt musical comparison, but as far as like the logistics of teasing, it reminds me a little bit of Bailey Zimmerman, who I think does like also a very good job in a much more mainstream space of being like, this thing is coming. It's still coming. It's coming soon. It's coming really soon here and then like you say by the time it actually arrives people know the words people are it's you've aggregated all this interest and i it's been interesting to see how that's worked for bailey in like a mainstream country space but also that noah's been able to to pull that off i want to get to the mumfordness of it i do want to get to it but i do think i want to talk a little bit about what does it mean to make music that sounds like this in this contemporary pop music environment because it's Things are cyclical. We can accept that in 10 to 20 year cycles, people will rediscover old sounds or rediscover old ideas. Obviously, you look at Zach Bryan being I'm going to collaborate with Nocon, but I'm also going to collaborate with the Lumineers like this is like who I grew up on and who's like carrying the torch now. Like that makes a lot of sense to me. But why do you think in this specific moment, like why have we hit the nostalgia revival cycle for this at this specific moment? It's a great question. And I, I think the answer is a little bit that like this is not Mumford 2.0 to me. I think that there are traces of the, you know, I was just talking to Rebecca about like the Bonnaroo summer of these dudes mm. with big acoustic guitars and rustic clothing. And we haven't had that in a minute. So to get back to that feel, that's certainly what Noah brings. But I don't know. I think that There's some nostalgia for that, but I also just think you have like a little bit of a country vibe. You also have the kind of storytelling and pop ambition. I was listening to 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 the Stick Season album the other day, and it reminded me of like early Ed Sheeran, which you wouldn't really put into like the Mumford Lumineers of Monsters and Men vibe, but also is a little bit of a cousin of that. So I think it's a a nostalgia for that period, but also an amalgamation of of everything around it back in the early 2010s also going on in pop music. I guess that's my educated guess, though. I don't know. My left field Hail Mary pass on trying to figure it out was actually Folklore Evermore, which is this recurring. Everybody can take a drink now. My recurring pop is like not albums I particularly enjoy. Folklore more than ever more I like, but these are not to me peak Taylor Swift albums. But I think by centering music of that nature at such a high level and, and broad spectrum of popularity, I think it softened up the marketplace for potentially more things in that realm. And I, I wonder if there's some, I was 16 when I heard Folklore, and now I'm 19 and I heard Noah Kahan, and that kind of feels like an arc, like a developmental arc. I wonder if that had anything to do with it. Rebecca, what do you think? Well, I'm so glad that you brought up Ed Sheeran, because if you listen to Noah Kahn's first ever album, it is so Ed Sheeran influenced. And I don't know whether that's like on purpose or not, but it sounds exactly like Ed Sheeran's exact mix of like acoustic and pop especially with the collab with Julia Michaels, like it's such an Ed Sheeran song. And I think what Ed Sheeran is, is, is bringing from, he's, he's painted himself as a sort of small town English kid. And I think that's the same thing that Noah Khan is going with that he didn't go in with at first. And I mean, it's, it's funny because there is a lot of skepticism among Vermonters that he actually grew up a lot in New Hampshire and the record label is putting a lot of stock into the Vermont basket because it sounds folksier. (laughs) And I, okay. I had, several people in my dms is not did not make it to the story but they were like he's not actually from vermont <laughs> like, wow. damn wow. Uh, and they were like yeah they're definitely just doing this because it sounds cute. is there gonna be like a um, local paper expose <laughs> like someone like doing the like the school records dig and all this kind of stuff gets a little yeah. bit more like, famous <laughs> yes but i think because he's always been honest okay well he went to school over the border and that that specific school takes kids from both sides but like a lot of his some of his classmates dm'd me and they were like he did not live in Vermont during that time. He lived in New what? Hampshire. <laughs> Damn. I picture like a negative ad campaign. Yeah. Of like, how many stick seasons did Noah really experience? <laughs> like the Grammy Oppo research campaign. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my God. Before we go on, can we listen to Hurt Somebody, which is the record you just mentioned with Julian Michaels? So this is the first kind of big Noah Con single. Is that correct? Yeah. It's from Busy Ed. Yeah. All right, let's listen to, to Hurt Somebody. Hold me close. 
close and I won't leave Cause it hurts when you hurt somebody So much to say but I don't speak And I hate that I let you stop me uh, Hold me close and I won't leave Cause it hurts when you hurt somebody Even like the choice in 2019 to make a song with Julia Michaels yeah. tells me you're going in a slightly different direction than the direction that you actually ended up going in and, and kind of getting known for. And I think part of that is he's not the first artist to like go folk during COVID. Obviously, Taylor Swift did that very famously. <laughs> uh, and I think it's such a surprise to me. That's what took off and not the kind of poppy, already popular style of music that he was making previously. And I think he kind of ran with it and to to great success. I mean, I will say the uh, you mentioned Joel Little earlier, Jason. He's very good, but there is a, a little bit of a sameness to a lot of that production. And I, I find that especially for people with relatively signature voices, it can be a tiny bit neutering. And I, I think maybe going folk. I, and again, I don't I don't know what's in anyone's heart. Who can know? <laughs> <laughs> who would who can know what's in people's hearts? But I wonder if on some level it's wanting to just lean back into the specificity of the voice and then making the musical choices that allow the specificity of the voice to do what it does. I think so. And the, the thing is also like one thing Noah's talked about a lot, at least especially recently, is just not wanting to be defined by one sound. He's not like, I'm waving the banner for the stomp clap comeback and <laughs> Mumford and sons. I'm the son of Mumford. Like he's not about that at all. I, I wouldn't. And part of the thing that that kind of reminds me of it, going back to Ed Sheeran is I could see his next album be partially produced by like Metro Boomin. Like I could see him hang out with Jack Antonoff and go big pop. I, I don't know. Like I could certainly foresee that. Will the ops of him spending time in New Hampshire hamper that? I don't know. But no, I think that to your point, he is a little bit, especially the first two albums, a little bit all over the place in terms of his sound. He has locked in on this new school folk pop with a little dash of country in the Zach Bryan world. But yeah, he could expand beyond that for sure. Okay, I just want to go on record saying I do. I wish he will not make a record with Metro Boom, and I just would like to say that. <laughs> God forbid if it happens, I want to at least be on record as being against it. Ten percent <laughs> chance that happens. It's not a not zero. That's all. I'll say. Call all things. Call Jason. Don't call me when that happens. Call Jason. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the legacy for a second. And I, I just I have there are words I have to say. I just want to say them. Numineers. Mumford and grandsons. I just had to get that out. <laughs> I just wow. had to just I've been sitting on that for weeks. I just have to put that in the world. So now that that's, that's in the world, I feel unburdened. That was a challenging era. I think it was a challenging era. Certainly for me, M many people loved this music. I recently reread my review of a Mumford and Son show, maybe at the Barclay Center or at the Garden. And I, I have a very tactile like, sense memory of being at that show and feeling like I was the only person not enjoying it. Like it's happened to me only a few times in my career, but that was one where I was like, I'm at war with these 18,000 people in this room, <laughs> like actively. The politics, like the kind of cultural politics of that music at that time was late 2000s pop is like so digital, so engineered. It's obviously it's the era where hip hop producers are going and making pop records like Timbaland, Pharrell, whatever. They're doing big pop records. There was always something that felt a tiny bit reactionary about the embrace of artists like that at that moment. Can we talk about that moment in the early 2010s and what do we actually think now with the benefit of a decade removed? What do we think was actually happening at that time? I think what happened was a similar reaction back then as to what's happening now. I think the post to post 2000s really hyper poppy tabloid culture produced this backlash that that 
to me and I think to all of us, or actually at least me and John, maybe not Jason, <laughs> read as not to do like the dumbest cultural observation ever, but it read as very inauthentic. Like you see these like guys who look like they're from West Hollywood putting on big old hats and like vests and being like, we're from Appalachia and here's our little banjo song. And it just felt very cringe to a lot of people. Who knows if that's true? I don't know where the Lumineers are from, to be honest, but to, they just sounded like they came out of like a Protestant mega church. But I, I think now it's a backlash to again like the really you know heavily heavily produced pop music that you can write by sending files back and forth it's sort of like you know a more like lo-fi approach to to pop i guess but i at least i think that noah khan and people like him have learned from the past and now i feel like it's more crunchy granola flannel shirts nalgene bottles whereas i think before mumford and sons and the lumineers was hitting a more hipster fied artisan maker culture that was happening at the time and now a different wow. culture is happening at the time that there's maker <laughs> and, yeah and i'm thinking like he's going for the cottage core aesthetic i think more so than the hipster Fight. Also, I'm, I'm I'm really glad you alluded to religion because I think actually, <laughs> well, no, because I, I do think those sing-alongs are, are very church-like, like they, they always were. And I, I never thought about this in the time, but I'm thinking about it now. I imagine actually one of the closest parallels to a Mumford and Sons at the time was actually probably Hillsong in terms of these kind of like big arena white folk sing-alongs. There's probably a lot to be gleaned from looking at the rise of Hillsong with that kind of music. And again, being in that arena at the time, I remember like everybody is very worshipful. And I, maybe that's why I felt like an apostate because I was like, I just I just can't. It's not it. And that, too, goes with what it's like being at a Noah Khan concert. From what I hear, it's just like a lot of people just like, oh, my God, like you are describing my childhood. Like I'm pouring out my childhood trauma to this guy who's singing about it. And we have these like white people sing along banjo stuff happening. The aspect of Noah's rise that reminds me most closely of like the Mumford and Sons. Rebecca, you were talking about northern New England and, and how you don't really hear many voices in, in popular music from there. And one of the things that really stood out to me from Mumford and Sons blowing up the way they did was that they toured forever behind their first album and then had this huge uh, blow up from their, their second album. But when they toured behind their first album, they played they purposely played every market that doesn't get huge acts and they just went crisscross the United States and parts of Europe where they were like, oh, this is like a small town. They just really invested in that and it really paid off for them. And I don't think that's necessarily what Noah's doing in terms of like his tour routing. Obviously, he's playing to some smaller markets, but I do think that kind of lack of representation is there too. To your point, you don't have to, obviously, he's got a lot of buy-in from New England and just representing that that space but also to your point feel like listeners feeling seen by him and his experiences and specifically what he's talking about definitely reminds me of that kind of aspect of the Mumford blow up why do you think we're seeing a return to music of this texture in this specific moment because i i think it's interesting in that it feels both anti technology but also completely facilitated by Im the immediacy afforded by technology. Like I remember seeing like when Zach posted that him and Noah were in the studio together and like in a prior or era or lifetime, you'd be like, well, that'd be great. Cause 18 months from now, maybe track seven on some album will be a collaboration with these guys. And wouldn't that be awesome to hear? And instead it was like 36 hours later, here's an EP. If there's something the way that artists like this are using technology to transmit something that feels distinctly handmade and untechnological. I wonder if we could talk about that because that to me is an underappreciated or under discussed aspect of how places like TikTok function. We tend to think of it in hyper terms, hyper pop or accelerating things, but it also allows for the dissemination of distinctly unaccelerated culture. 
I just think it, it goes back to exactly what we we're talking about in terms of social media and that sort of authenticity that people are looking for, whether it's, you know, folklore evermore or whether, you know, you think about like the Olivia Rodrigo album from this year and it's like a, it's like a rock record where it's like, Hey, this is, these are real guitars. This is really steeped in. You've been reading Karen Gans. I appreciate yes, that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. But it's true. I mean, and like, I mentioned Phoebe Bridgers, but like that is exhibit a of like, that's to me, one of the defining albums of this decade, just because there's not, it's not overproduced. There's not too much going on, but it just feels very real and very powerful. And I think again, transmitted through social media and lyrics on Instagram and TikTok, and Noah's just riding that wave as well. You're right to, to, point out that this is going concurrently with AI music and but I don't I also don't hear a ton of the turbo pop of the 2010s that is going on there's a little bit of that but in the same way that like Mumford and Sons existed with the turbo pop of that time this feels like a course correction from the technological advent you're talking about it where and I think that the authenticity authenticity of, of that pop movement is actually winning out that that feels like much more dominant in pop music today Rebecca, can you talk a little bit about how that kind of aesthetic works on TikTok and not strictly speaking for for this musician or even for music, but but more broadly, since this is your bailiwick, you know, you live here. Can you talk a little bit about these kind of handmade aesthetics and how they function in this extremely digital and rapid sphere? This aesthetic is like the daughter of, yeah, the hipster maker aesthetic that was, you know, in the late 2000s, early 2010s. And so much of it lives online. And I think the pandemic really gave this aesthetic a big boost. It's a huge part of nostalgia, like wholesome nostalgia culture that really proliferated. And I want to say like the early part of 2020. And I wrote a piece in 2020 about how kids who maybe they were at college or they just like couldn't go out anymore. They were going back to live with their parents and they retreated into like their childhood selves. They were revisiting their old Tumblr pages and they were watching like twi the Twilight movies all over again. And that's been happening ever like for the last three years, every two weeks, every, no, every like, two seconds, there's another TikTok trend of like, remember this from 2016? It wasn't that so long ago. Weren't you so much younger then? Don't you miss the year? Like, as you know, as if every, anyone wants to go back to 2016. But like, you know, I think this sort of like, ooh, woo, soft boy, soft girl culture is so prominent in the culture right now and that Noah Khan feels perfectly suited for it because he's this attractive active, like cute crush object for people, but also just this very sexless. A lot of his music is about his, his anxiety, his depression. His, it talks about alcoholism, whether or not he defines himself that way, whatever. But it's, it's this very like, I'm, I have so many feelings and sometimes I make bad choices, but I'm trying to be better or whatever that really feels suited for this moment and people are really hungry for it. And yeah, it's just this like earnestness, wholesome culture that is really popular in the internet. <laughs> I think about how TikTok functions versus how IG has functioned in its various eras and, and certainly in contrast to Twitter and text-based social media was functioning. Is part of that because in essence, the kind of platonic ideal of a TikTok video is like one person in isolation doing a thing. Yeah. Obviously, there's ways that people have amplified and weaponized the interconnectivity and of how TikTok functions. But on a very pure level, the barrier to entry is low. And most videos that I see are, in essence, still just a person doing a thing. And that feels hand in hand with a kind of emotional intimacy. And when we're talking about music, a kind of genre intimacy. Yeah. Every TikTok mostly feels like you're FaceTiming with a friend that you've never met before, that you don't know anything about. But the instant you see them, you're sort of like, oh, it's just us two. And I like you. It may be more than you would if you just saw a tweet or and you can watch so many more of them than you could with YouTube because they're so much shorter and things can spread so much more quickly on TikTok than they can because of that reason and also because of TikTok's algorithm. But that it makes it seem like when you see one video of someone doing something, it makes it feel like everyone's doing that. And so it's it, like this. These trends that spread sometimes aren't even really trends. They're like one video, some, one person doing something, but then they go so viral that you think everyone's doing that. And I think a lot of it is that's probably part of the reason why 
his you know, why any song goes viral on TikTok because you're like, oh my god, like this is something that a lot of people are doing just because it, that one video has gotten a lot of attention. And it's like you say, it's like a collect, it's an individual, which makes you think that it's actually many individuals. Yes. Yeah. And I, Jason, my my sort of favorite iteration of this is when a song goes like a song, like a sound goes viral maybe it's record label engineered or maybe it's organic who can say but like a sound goes viral and it's not of like a hand played kind of thing it's like a dance record or like a hip-hop record or whatever and then like on day four or day nine or whenever everybody gets their shit together uh then all of a sudden you have the the vertical video of the singer or the rapper like being like it's me (laughs) even there's even this need for sounds that frankly don't require an individual there's plenty of records that go viral where i'm like i don't need to know what this person looks like dresses like whatever but there is still within this ecosystem the urge or perhaps the need as a way of furthering the thing to to individualize it and be like yeah this big overproduced record it's just me on my phone. And I feel like that happens a lot. And like often it's a failure because like by that point, I don't actually want like by day nine, I don't care. Like it's like the things moving. But I do think that it's notable that people feel like they have to do it or record labels feel like they have to do it. Yeah, it's almost been five years of this, of just the music <laughs> industry figuring out what to do with 10 second snippets that take off and then the artists behind them. It's interesting in terms of going back to Noah, like we could talk about like stick season as a song and dial drunk. I I love dial drunk. It's probably his best single and his best, maybe his best song. I think it's a good thing for Noah that he is not tied to one song. Like it, he has not suffered the 10 second explosion that you're talking about, which is just like one line or one chorus or one, even one song has really defined him. Steve Lacey-itis. Yeah. And shout out to Bad Habit. It's an amazing song, but he's forever as of now tied to that song. So by having Dial Drunk do well, but not incredible, and She Calls Me Back, Northern Attitude, like all these songs have tens of millions of streams, but they aren't career defining in a way that really helps Noah and he can use them as a springboard for a years long run after this instead of just like a year of like hey that that song from 2023 and then then he's gone also just looking at like the Spotify numbers on stick season every song basically is over 20 million streams maybe like one or two or below but it's not like we have this one record that's all the way up here and then a bunch of like, eh, we don't know. It's like the clearly people are engaging with the fullness of the work or they're they have multiple entry points. And so I, I think you're right that he's likely to avoid that thing. Are, are you surprised to see how quickly this is translating or maybe it's not quick. Maybe this is just the optics of it into the touring at the scale. I mean, I think he's doing arenas next or is he doing stadiums? Or yeah, he's, doing no, he's, he's doing arenas like, but that's, I mean, it still seems fast. Are you struck by that? And also by how fast and Rebecca, I'm curious about this, how fast someone who had success on TikTok can translate that into actual money and actual sales, which is where we know a lot of musicians really make their money is not on the streaming numbers, but is on the live shows. Jason, are you surprised how fast it's happening? A little bit. We saw the kind of pre-explosion this year where he's playing theaters like he he played Radio City multiple nights. And and that was before Dial Drunk really took off. And then you were like, oh, this Noah Khan is really doing well on the road. We've seen that a little bit where they will develop a kind of theater level presence artist kind of in the rock or, or folk or indie lane and just never kind of bubble up. And then to push it to arenas. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a little bit surprised. But when you see the streaming numbers and when you see how well all of his songs are doing and how well Dial Drunk continues to do now months after its release, I'm not shocked for sure. And Rebecca, when you're thinking about it as far as like a TikTok success story, is the actual what we're seeing here that... Some folks who come out of who have this burst of success on TikTok are able to like steadily land in a place that is monetizable in a long way. Or is it that to call it a TikTok success story is actually kind of a retrograde way to think of it because these are the success stories. 
and frankly, much more so than a radio success story. Like for Deluxe this week, we were looking at the pop airplay charts. And I was like, what are these songs? Like literally, <laughs> there's like 10 songs in there. I was like, what literally, what are these songs? Like, Welcome what to are my they? world, John. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. And I was like, who's listening to them and who would and maybe who would pay to go see them? Maybe the TikTok success story is the success story because it connects people so closely that it makes them want to go see them. Is that feel right based on your read? Well, to me, a TikTok is a culture. And you could make the argument that, yeah, like TikTok, I mean, TikTok did totally springboard his career. But same for Olivia Rodrigo, two people who are already signed to major records, though. And Olivia Rodrigo is like already famous. But yeah, I think that is the method of knowing whether someone is huge or has has it can fill out an arena or something or whatever. And be, I think because his sound is so right for this moment, because he has not just one hit, but like several hits now, to me, it, it makes total sense. What's a slept on no con song that we should go out with? Let's do a deep cut for the people. If you want to go for the most like kind of cloying Vermontiness, do the view between villages. I like the song New Perspectives. I think that's a slept on one. Okay, uh, we will go out on a new perspective. I want to just put in a vote for All My Love, which I think the writing is really beautiful on and was maybe the first song that I listened to from him as as good as Stick Season might be. Like, it just never really grabbed me. But like that song really like took a hold of me. And I thought I think it was really sharp. And Jason, what's your vote? Even though we're going to go out with Rebecca's song. No disrespect. <laughs> We didn't really talk too much about like the like the collaborations and the cosigns, but Casey Musgraves hopped on. She calls me back. I really like that song before the collaboration. I think her version's great, but that's a great one, too. OK, I was going to say that, but it's not slept on. So it's not slept right. on. That's, that's and slept also on. just like where's the piece written by me or you or you or anybody of just like Casey Musgraves about to have a comeback on the back of all this stuff. Like Casey Musgraves maybe having like a low season and like all of a sudden like. We back on top. Just something to think about. Just file, just filing that away. If I don't do it, someone's going to do it. So let's put that idea out in the world. <laughs> that is our show. Thank you to Jason. Thank you to Rebecca. Listen to every podcast ever at nytimes.com slash podcast. Also, Podcast Deluxe, which is me and Joe yimmer yammering on Extremely Loud Chairs, is on YouTube. All those episodes are tinyurl.com slash podcast deluxe. Subscribe to podcast anywhere you get your audio content or audio visual content. That is Spotify, Apple, YouTube, et cetera. Email us, podcastnytimes.com. We have a mailbag episode coming up in the next couple of weeks. So hit us with the questions, podcastnytimes.com. Also, new voicemail number. Joe and I recorded an outgoing message, 856-539-4305. I'm going to say that again in case you're scrambling to get a pen. 856-539-4305. Leave a voicemail. Maybe we will play it on podcast. Our producer, as always, is Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media. We will be back next week. Also, new perspectives. <laughs> <laughs>